vaping is actually harder to quit than cigarette smoking for most people. Now, does that mean that cigarette smoking is fairly easy to quit for most people? No. 70% of people who smoke cigarettes report that they would like to quit if they thought they could. The success rate of quitting smoking when people try to go just cold turkey, just quit with no assistance whatsoever, they might tell their family and friends, hey, I'm quitting, that's it, is exceedingly low. It's 5%. And of the 5% that succeed in quitting, a full 65% of them relapse within a year. So that's a very depressing picture. But it's not to say that people cannot quit. In fact, they can. There are a couple of methods that have been shown to help people quit. One of the main ones that's received a lot of attention in recent years is bupropyrone, sometimes referred to by its commercial name, Wellbutrin. Now, bupropyrone is a compound that increases the release of dopamine and to a lesser extent, epinephrine and some other neurochemicals as well. It's used for the treatment of depression and for smoking cessation. Now, I wanna point out again, I'm not a psychiatrist, so I'm not telling you to take bupropyrone, aka Wellbutrin, but I'm gonna give you a little bit of the contour of what's typically done in terms of bupropyrone administration to help people get relief from some of the withdrawal symptoms of trying to quit smoking or vaping or other forms of nicotine ingestion. Typically, bupropyrone is taken in 300 milligram per day doses divided into two dosages of 150 milligrams each, or sometimes there's a slow release formula. The dosages will vary from person to person. I wanna really emphasize that there is an increased seizure risk with bupropyrone. It only occurs in a small fraction of the population, but nonetheless is a real concern for those members of the population. So for those of you with seizure risk, whether you know it or not, that's going to be a valid concern in terms of potential side effects. The other thing about bupropyrone is that it has to be used with caution in patients that have liver disease or renal disease that can impact the amount that anyone can take, meaning sometimes people have to take a much lower dose if they have renal disease or liver disease, and sometimes they can't take it at all. Sometimes if people are taking benzodiazepines for whatever reason or other sedatives, there are contraindications there. So bupropyrone isn't a you know kind of one size fits all or magic bullet for quitting smoking. Nonetheless, for people that can take it safely, and again, this is a prescription drug, a board certified psychiatrist or other physician is going to have to prescribe it for you if it's appropriate for you. And it moves that number of 5% success rate to about what one sees with the clinical hypnosis to about 20% of people will successfully overcome their nicotine, or I should say their smoking or vaping addiction. Now it's important to ask why this would work, right? I mean, it's not as if bupropyrone is increasing nicotine per se. What it's doing is it's tapping on that mesolimbic reward pathway, increasing dopamine, or at least allowing dopamine levels to stay substantially elevated enough that people don't experience some of the drop in dopamine that leads to the withdrawal symptoms, the lessening of mood, et cetera. And it's no coincidence that bupropyrone is also an antidepressant. It's a common antidepressant for people that experience negative side effects with the so-called SSRIs, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors that prevent them from taking those things like less in libido or appetite, or in some cases, increased appetite or any number of other side effects that some people, not all, but some people experience with SSRIs, they'll be prescribed Wellbutrin, bupropyrone uh, is the generic name. Uh, so Wellbutrin being the commercial name again, bupropyrone is what they'll be prescribed instead with the caveats of seizure risk, renal disease, liver disease, et cetera. The outcomes with Wellbutrin for smoking cessation are pretty good. I mean, if you think about an increase from 5% to 20%, that's pretty dramatic. And yet I also want to refer back to the incredible success of the clinical hypnosis approach. Again, you can find that at reverie.com. The clinical hypnosis approach has a success rate of 23%. So it's very closely aligned with, if not exceeding the success rate with bupropyrone. Of course, there are other pharmacologic approaches to quitting smoking or vaping. All of them generally circle back to increasing dopamine and or norepinephrine in order to offset some of the withdrawal symptoms of smoking sensation or vaping cessation. A very common approach for people to try and quit smoking or vaping is to use nicotine itself to try and prevent people from seeking nicotine through a cigarette or a vape pen. What I mean by that is people using a nicotine patch or nicotine gum or other nicotine delivery device that is not cigarettes and not vaping in order to maintain levels of nicotine in their bloodstream, which of course means maintain levels of nicotine in their brain and body to the same extent that they would if they were smoking or vaping, maybe even gradually taking down the total amount of nicotine in their brain and body by reducing the number or size of nicotine gum pieces that they ingest each day or keeping the patch on for a shorter amount of time or getting a lower dose patch that releases less nicotine total or over time. All of those approaches have been shown to be reasonably successful. I'll get to the numbers in a few minutes, but reasonably successful in allowing people to quit smoking or vaping. Again, most of the data is on cigarette smoking because vaping is a relatively new phenomenon, although 
quite troublingly, it's a very rapidly increasing behavior, especially in the young population. So that's why I'm kind of lumping these two things together because I think very soon we are going to need an all out campaign for how to counter vaping addiction. So what do we know about smoking cessation using nicotine itself? Is the patch best? Is nicotine gum best? turns out that a combination of approaches is best. So somewhat surprising, but it was very clear from the literature that I was able to find that using nicotine patches for some period of time and then switching to a gum and then perhaps switching to an, a nasal spray, that's going to be the most effective. Then the question is how long to continue each of those and whether or not to overlap them. It seems as if doing one for about a week and then switching to another for about a week and then switching to another is one rational and reasonable approach that many people have used successfully. Why would that be? Well, it all has to do with the different rates of absorption of nicotine into the bloodstream and then the downstream consequences of that on the dopamine, acetylcholine, epinephrine, and other systems of the brain and body. And while there hasn't been an extremely detailed study of the exact kinetics of you know, how the nasal sprays versus the transdermal patches versus the gums, et cetera, work, there's a logical structure to it that will immediately make sense to you. First of all, the transdermal patches provide a fairly steady state dopamine release across the day. And oftentimes people are wearing them at night as well. Uh, this is relevant because if people are ingesting nicotine by way of smoking and vaping, you know, hopefully they're not waking up in the middle of the night just to smoke or vape or believe it or not, some people do that. But of course, while people are asleep, they are not smoking or vaping. They always tell you don't fall asleep with a cigarette in your mouth, you burn the whole house down. But exceedingly rare to have people who are smoking in their sleep. So people wake up in the morning and because the half-life of nicotine from smoking or vaping is very short, anywhere from one to two hours, they're essentially in a state of withdrawal at the point where they wake up in the morning. How can I say that? Well, remember, withdrawal sets in about four hours after the last ingestion of nicotine by cigarette or by inhalation from the vape pen. So people are waking up in nicotine withdrawal and then immediately going into the behavior of ingesting nicotine or very soon after waking for most people. So nicotine patch is going to be very effective for a week or so. Again, talk to your physician about the best approach for this, but then switching to a nasal spray or switching to nicotine gum for about a week, which is going to change the kinetics of that nicotine absorption into the bloodstream and change the release of dopamine and other neurochemicals within the brain. That's going to keep the system intentionally off balance so that it never comes to expect one single pattern or amplitude of dopamine release. And that is a very powerful way for a let's just call it a quitting method to work because as I've always said, the most powerful schedule of dopamine is going to be this random intermittent reward. This is what's used in the casinos in order to take your money. And generally they do on average, they take your money more than you take theirs and they take more of it, uh, not just more often, because they use this random intermittent schedule. The random intermittent schedule is one in which you don't really know when the peaks in dopamine are going to arrive, and so there isn't this expectation and craving, and then all of a sudden when dopamine is released, it's extremely high. That's how they get you to continue playing, even though basically you're losing money and your dopamine is dropping. They elevate it every once in a while. Nicotine replacement can be used in a similar way, but in a benevolent way in order to help you get over smoking or vaping by keeping the total amounts of dopamine variable around the clock and by changing the amount of dopamine that's released, it seems to help people behaviorally and psychologically because they don't come to expect having a particular amount of dopamine in their brain and blood at any given time.